Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to yet another 30k Horrors Heresy Lore Breakdown. Today we are on book number 11, Fallen Angels. And yes, I'm going to call it 11 because whilst Tales of Heresy is technically number 10, and I've skipped that because it's a collection of short stories, it is technically the 11th book, so there you go. Now, this is another book about the Dark Angels, with all that includes, although... This one, although still feeling the curse of the Dark Angels, is probably a little bit less cursed overall. And it gives us a lot of really interesting information about how Luther started to turn away from the lion. So strap in, this should be an interesting one. When last we saw our quote-unquote heroes, the Lion and Luther had had a bit of a falling out. I still think that Luther probably told the Lion about what he had done, because Luther seems to be under absolutely no illusions about the fact that he is essentially being exiled from the Legion. Along with Luther, some 500 legionnaires, half a chapter's worth, are sent back to Caliban. There is no official disgrace, they're not shamed or anything. The official reason is that the Crusade is entering into a new operational phase, and therefore the First Legion is going to be requiring a lot more recruits. Ergo, they are sending half a chapter's worth of combat troops back to Caliban to help train them. Now, obviously, you can see the incongruity in that one. If the Legion really is so desperate for troopers, why would they send back 500 primarily fully operational and healthy combat personnel? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, especially as they're not that veteran either. They've had precisely one campaign under their belt. They're not exactly hoary old veterans being sent back to impart their wisdom onto the younger generation. Hell, they're barely any more veteran than the people they are going to be training. With the exception of Luther and a few of the non-Astartes personnel, obviously. Upon arrival back on Caliban, Luther tries his best, born leader that he is, to keep his men from, well, falling completely to despair, basically. They all think they've been more or less exiled from the Legion, and none of them have missed out on the fact that pretty much everybody that got sent back was from Caliban, with only a handful of Terrans. Additionally, of course, they notice that Luther, the Legion's second in command, another person that really, really shouldn't be sent back, is, well, right there on the ship with them. Luther tries to cheer them up, telling them that this is all temporary, once the recruiting numbers are up, they'll rejoin the Legion for glory, they'll go back to the Lion with an army at their back, an army they helped train and so on, but Luther knows that's a lie, and he tells Zahariel as much. Oh, and by the way, yes, Zahariel is with him, he is now Luther's main aide-de-camp, his second-in-command, essentially and a fairly respected member of the Outcast Astartes. I'm going to call them Outcasts because, well, I need to differentiate them from the non-Outcast Astartes. Speaking of which, Nemiel, the far less serious counterpart to Zahario, has become a Legion Chaplain. A living embodiment of the Legion spirit. Uh, well, everything considered, Nemiel isn't actually that bad of a fit. He's stubborn, he's unyielding, he's prideful to a fault, and he is a brutish motherfucker. There certainly are worse representations of the Dark Angels out there. And it's not just Nemuel who has risen quite considerably since last we saw him as well. It's been about 50 odd years now since Luther's de facto exile, and the uh, Dark Angels' first expeditionary fleet, or 42nd expedition your fleet to be correct, but the first fleet for the Dark Angels, because it is of course the Primarch's fleet, has grown from a mere seven vessels, once we saw them apart with Luther, to just under a hundred vessels now. A substantial force, but currently deeply immeshed in an offensive operation against the Shield Worlds. A series of less than compliant worlds that were currently being brought to the Empress Light. Except, this is right around the time when Horus decides to go full traitor, and virus bomb his own troops on Istvan. The Lion gets word of this, and is of course ordered to do whatever he can to, well, fuck with Horus. 
The lion notices immediately that Horus is planning ahead. He is seeding the most stable warplanes towards Terra with rebellious elements, courtesy almost certainly of the Alpha Legion. In all due likelihood, this is in an effort to slow down any retribution coming from Terra. The Lion is uniquely positioned to strike at Horus quickly, but just as Horus had probably intended, he is too deeply enmeshed into his current campaign to react swiftly. It is assumed that it'll take a full eight months, even on an emergency stance, to disengage the Legion adequately to the point where they can move against Horus. That is eight months that they do not have. The Lion assumes, again, correctly, that Horus is going to be requiring a vast quantities of materials to fortify one of the plans in the Istvan system against the coming Loyalist Storm. And as it so happens, there is a world relatively close by, Diomet, a ultra-class forge world that might be able to produce the amount of supplies Horus needs to fortify Istvan on such a short notice. Again, the Lion cannot send his entire legion since it'll take far, far too long, but a small strike force consisting of the Lion, some chosen companies, and a handful of vessels, most of which were slated to actually retreat back from the front line and uh, receive R&R &R as well as repairs, they might just be able to get there in time. A far from ideal strike force, but, well... As the saying goes, in times of need, even the devil eats flies. And these really were some stringy-ass flies. The shield worlds were controlled by the Gordians. Baseline humans, the kind that you would usually accept back into the Imperium if it weren't for the fact that they had allied with a bunch of Xenos species as well. We can't be having that, now can we? Unfortunately, they were also relatively decent at fighting. At the very least, it had taken quite a while for the Dark Angels to truly begin subduing the little bastards. They were now in a critical position where they actually had a good chance of finishing them off, so again, withdrawing immediately wasn't really much of an option, even if they could. This left the line with some 15 warships, mostly second line and support crafts, and some 200 Dark Angels veterans. Now, granted, these were hand-picked, the best of the best, but 200 Astartes. Whew. That is um, not much of a force, considering they might be up against the Warmaster's elites. Johnson is essentially banking on the idea that Horus would not have sent a first-line formation to, well, basically just raid a forge world. Why would he? Considering he is preparing for the fight of his life against what the Lion still thinks is an overwhelmingly larger Loyalist force, he would probably keep his Astartes forces close at hand since he can't be entirely sure when the Loyalists might show up. It's a gamble, to be sure, but it's not the worst one. Presuming, of course, that Horus does send a second line formation. If the lion runs face first into a front line formation of Astartes with battle barges, well, <laughs> that'll be that'll be a problem. But hey, optimism and all that. Whilst this is going on, back on Caliban, it turns out that Luther's actually done what he was sent to do. <laughs> kind of impressive, to be honest. I mean, Luther knew pretty much from the word go that he was never going back to the Legion, and he can't possibly have felt justly treated, shall we say, and yet he seems to have put in every available effort to make sure that he increases the rate at which the Lion receives reinforcements. Might be an attempt at you know, getting back into the Lion's good graces by going, oh hey, look, I'm still loyal, I can do this, or maybe even just making the Lion feel bad by obviously increasing the recruitment numbers and making them think that maybe I shouldn't have sent him back there anyways. Of course, it could also have the exact opposite effect, but hey, details. They've cut the training time of new Astartes from eight years down to two, which is pretty goddamn massive. Additionally, they have cut mortality rates down to precisely zero for three full training cadres, which is very incredible, considering that's working against the usual instabilities and random rejections of the gene seed. And in short, he's pretty much done more than anybody could ever ask. 
Through his reforms, Caliban is outputting more legionnaires than some legions' entire recruiting pools, and they have done more to increase and refine the process of training and deploying Astartes than any other legion. And yet, despite all of his efforts, no word has come from the Lion. In fact, we've learned previously, from Nemiel's point of view, that the Lion has just simply stopped reading the goddamn report, so... No matter how well Luther is doing, the Lion clearly doesn't care. Or alternatively, he is shielding himself from the successes of his foster father. Now, why would he be doing that, you might ask? Well, he might be afraid that he made a mistake. And as we've already seen, the Lion is, to put it fucking mildly, socially awkward, and has a lot of problem handling well, even the most banal of social interactions. If he has to admit that not only did he misjudge his adoptive father once, he misjudged him twice, well, yeah, bad enough the first time. He might also be afraid that the reports will contain some form of recrimination, some angry rant on behalf of Luther, and he might simply choose to just shield himself from any potential backlash, essentially just taking the entire problem and sweeping it neatly beneath the carpet. Might seem like rather cowardly behaviour from a Primarch, and well, it is, but again, this guy was essentially raised as a feral child in the middle of the forest. He has some pretty fucking serious problems when it comes to social interactions. And apparently, he had had problems with at least one further Astartes, by the name of Astalan. He had arrived on Caliban some 15 years after Luther and his lot, and Luther had remained tight-lipped about why he had arrived, but considering he's still goddamn there, we can probably infer that the Lion had a bit of an issue with him. Though to be entirely fair, apparently nobody's really made that much of an effort to try and get back to the Legion either. There has apparently not been any real requests or anything, they've simply been sitting around waiting for the Lion to call them back, which... not the most proactive of things, but they might simply be thinking that, well, they don't want to bother the Lion, or maybe Luther did a bit too good of a job convincing them that they would eventually be called back to the Legion. We do get to see the first attempt, however, being made now by Zahariel, who adds in an addendum message to the usual report, addressed directly to the Lion himself, where he requests, in very polite terms, that maybe just maybe he and his buddies could be rotated back into the Legion, since they of course lack the veterancy required to train the new recruit properly in the ever-evolving art of warfare, and maybe the Lion could send back some other veterans to take their place to teach the young ones in the new doctrines that they have invented during their years out in the galaxy. And eventually he basically pleads that even if the Lion would only summon back one of them, it should be Luther, because Luther has done everything he possibly can to, well, make amends, basically. Now, since the Lion doesn't even bother listening to these reports anymore, in all the likelihood, fat load of good that is going to do him, but... Well, it is addressed directly to him, and it does come from Zahariel, not Luther, so... Perhaps, maybe the Lion would have listened to it. It's way too fucking late at this point anyway, but hey, it would be interesting to see what would have happened. As it stands, the message never gets sent, because Luther has cancelled all off-world deployments due to a rising wave of insurrection sweeping over Caliban. A wave of insurrection that Luther so far has kept entirely fucking secret. Oh boy, this is gonna get good, isn't it? Zahariel wanders off immediately to find Luther, who then informs Zahariel that the rebellion has in fact been taking place over the last few months, and uh, apparently it came out of absolutely goddamn nowhere. First, there were minor hints that something was going amiss, you know, minor shit, vandalization, minor acts of insignificant sabotage, stuff that would go far beneath the notice of the planet's governor, in this case, Luther, de facto at least. But over the course of the next few months, it spiralled into an uncontrollable fashion, where outright sabotage, attacks, and all manners of nonsense was taking place. The production of ammunition on Caliban had fallen by 15%, an unacceptable fall from previous standards, and Luther, knowing this, had made up for the shortfall using the pre-existing stocks of ammunition, weapons, and armour on Caliban. 
Essentially, he had been emptying out his very own armories to make up for the shortfalls that were being sent off planet. This is a massive breach of protocol and the Lion would be none too happy if he ever were to hear about it. Luckily, he never reads the report anymore and Zahadil's report had... Well, this might be one of the reasons why it was never sent. In all due essentiality, Zahadil had just become an accomplice by forging a report. Whoops. But not to fear, the Luther has it all well in hand. He has initiated measures to take care of the local insurrection. He has held back a full Astartes chapter, just in case, but before he deploys those, he is going to be sending in local Calibanite troops, the Jaegers, a special Imperial Army formation that is unique to Caliban. The reasoning, obviously, is that since they are local, they will have a far easier time dealing with the population, rather than if they sent in an off-world Imperial Army regiment, which undoubtedly would ruffle quite a few feathers. And considering this would appear to be the beginnings of a populist uprising, that's probably the last thing you want. Oh, and by the way, we get another mention of the mysterious Lord Cypher here. So, the Lord Cypher is a person within the Dark Angels Legion who is entrusted with the keeping of various old traditions, the spirit of the Legion, a kind of proto-chaplain in a way. He was elected from a very little known chapter of the Order before they became a full-on Legion. He was not the person who was expected to fulfill the role, that was another unvenerable member of the Legion. Instead, being a complete newcomer, he brought in some worried glances to begin with, but he seemed inoffensive enough, he mostly kept to himself reading books and studying the old traditions, so nobody really paid him all of that much mind. Being the keeper of the Legion's secrets, he also, of course, remained behind on Caliban. As to why he was given the Astartes enhancements, considering he's essentially just a law keeper, well... I guess he was accepted along with the rest of the Legion, in the same way that the rest of the leadership was accepted. We will also learn some additional reasons later, but I feel like we should probably do that when we get to it. So for now, all you need to know is that a minor rebellion seems to be spreading on the Dark Angels' homeworld, and Luther is currently trying to deal with said rebellion. Meanwhile, a million, trillion, zillion, billion miles away, the lion is busy dealing with his own problems. He has now arrived above the Forge World to find... the Sons of Horus. Or, well, luckily, not the actual Sons of Horus, rather an Imperial Army formation of Second Line units loyal to the Sons of Horus. Just like he'd hoped. Although there was a bit more of them there than he had strictly speaking hoped, he brought 15 ships. They had brought 30 ships. They had twice as many capital ships, twice as many scout ships, and god only knows how many Imperial Army regiments. Considering the fact that the plant itself was guarded by some seven regiment of local forces, in addition to whatever else the Mechanicum had on planet, oh, to clarify, local forces would be the local PDF and Imperial Army troops, whilst the Mechanicus, well, they play by their own rules, and they are not obliged to share the secrets of their army disposition with any other Imperial forces. But before we can worry about how many enemy forces are on the planet, we need to deal with the shit in space first. So, how is our Pussycat Commander-in-Chief going to deal with this predicament? Well, he is outnumbered, two to one, although not outgunned to quite that degree. He is, after all, in command of an Astartes battle barge, and the heaviest thing the enemy has is a Grand Cruiser. Unfortunately, the enemy does have twice as many Grand Cruisers as the Lion has capital ships, so that's a bit of a problem. Also, I'd just like to point out, the Lion actually also makes a joke here as well, and it flies right over Nemiel's head. Nemiel is standing there, kind of nervous, like, okay, we're outnumbered. Are we going to get murdered now? And so he looks up at the Lion and goes, Sir, we're outnumbered two to one. To which the Lion responds, I can do spatial calculations in my head. I think I can manage to count to 30 without your help. Which is rather sassy, I gotta admit. Lemuel, of course, panics because, well, he's probably never heard the lion make a joke before. And so the lion has to stop and go, Calm down, Lemuel. I'm not actually about to whack you over the head with a sword. I'm just making a joke. You know, levity and all that. 
I heard you humans were fond of the experience. I do kind of love that entire scene right there because it shows just how fucking rare it is for the lion to make a joke. Even when it is blatantly obvious that he's making one, even one of his closest subordinates has to kind of look up and... You're, uh... You're joking, right? Yeah? Yeah, you are. But you just leave for all involved, his sense of naval strategy is considerably better than his sense of humour, and the lion quite handily manages to defeat a naval force twice his size. He does so by first defeating their screening forces. The enemy captain, feeling a little bit cocky because he's outnumbering the enemy twice to one, sends out his own screens a bit too far ahead. And the lion has perfectly accounted for precisely how long it's going to take for the enemy's pickets to reach his own, so that when they reach his scout ships, they are faced with three threats at once. A wave of assault crafts launched preemptively from the Dark Angel's fleet, the Dark Angel's own picket ships, and the main Dark Angel fleet just closing into maximum weapons range. The commander of the enemy scout squadron kinda panics a little bit and decides to fire everything he has at the approaching picket ships. He manages to bag two with a wave of torpedoes, but over half of the incoming torpedoes are neutralized by the wave of assault craft. The remainder are either destroyed or avoided by the picket ships, with zero torpedoes reaching the main battle line. In return, the Astartes assault craft punch straight through the traitor picket line formations, doing considerable damage as they pass, and the pickets are now left with most of their weapons peeled off by the assault crafts and completely at the mercy of the approaching Dark Angel's fleet and their own scout ships. This rapid maneuver also means that most of the Dark Angel's own scout screen is so close to the main battle line that it would have to turn considerably to engage them. Instead of doing so, the captain of the fleet decides to focus his firepower on the encroaching main elements, assuming that the enemy's picket ships will be heading straight towards the enemy's transport ships. The enemy has placed their main line between the Dark Angels and their transports in an attempt to shield them. However, the wave of incoming assault craft and picket ships coming in from the Dark Angels far faster than the enemy captain had expected has pretty much made his entire placement vaguely irrelevant. He has to now gamble that the enemy's smaller crafts will head towards the main transport ships, which is still guarded by a few line ships. He hopes then that the second line will be able to deal with the enemy's scouts, while he holds position to welcome the the main Dark Angel's fleet. However, he is incorrect. Instead of heading straight towards the transport ships, the scouts and the assault craft turn at a breakneck speed in a very difficult maneuver that would require a lot of spatial calculations considering this is a bunch of ships turning very, very, very close together with one another at extraordinarily high speed, but well, the lion is damn smart when it comes to tactics, and he pulls it off perfectly. Now, the enemy's main flotilla is caught between two Dark Angels' forces. They, just moments ago, had outnumbered the Dark Angels, and yet now they find themselves surrounded, receiving volley after volley of torpedoes to the fore and stern quarters of their ships. It does not take long at all under that kind of a bombardment before the traitor's main battle line completely crumples and disintegrates. The Dark Angel fleet, after sweeping away the enemy's main line of opposition, then heads straight towards the transport ships. This is a little bit of a bluff, because despite their victory being rather overwhelming, they just face down twice their numbers in a pitched space battle. They have lost two of their picket ships, and pretty much every single other ship in their fleet has suffered moderate to severe damage, and a couple of ships have been downright crippled. Once again, however, the Lion's Gambit works out beautifully. 
The remainder of the enemy fleet guarding the transport ship just saw their main force get annihilated in a very short span of time. This means that they are rather nervous, and secondly, their primary duty is to protect the transport ships, because if they're destroyed, well, the entire reason to go to this planet in the first place will kind of disappear, and so they choose to withdraw away from the Dark Angel's fleet, allowing them to enter into safe orbit above the planet and deploy their own troops without the traitor flotilla being able to interfere with their landing operations. Well then, 2 to 1 naval combat whilst having mostly smaller ships than the enemy. Not bad, not bad at all. Granted, he did catch the enemy with a little bit of surprise, and he was in command of Nastati's battle barge, and, well, he is a goddamn Primarch, but still, that is quite the achievement. I really do like the description earlier, where the Lion is considered to be one of the finest tacticians inside of the entire Imperium, except his understanding of tactics, his grasp of the art, is far more intuitive. Like, he kind of just instinctively grasps the ebb and flow of battle, whilst in comparison somebody like Gilliman understands the logic of combat. He knows that if he does A, B will be a result of that, or possibly to a certain percentage degree, C. Whilst the Lion, he doesn't make that kind of calculation, he doesn't make that kind of planning, he just kind of feels out what is likely to happen, and he goes with his instincts almost all of the time. Now, of course, this could leave him at the mercy of the random whims of the battlefield, after all, no plan ever survives contact with the enemy, but considering he's a Primarch, his first plan is likely to be pretty goddamn good, and secondly, the simple fact that he does all of this by instinct, by instinctual understanding means that he will be able to act extraordinarily quickly, even by Primarch standards. Whilst another commander might have to, you know, weigh up the pros and cons of any given decision, the Lion just makes it like a snap decision, because he already kind of understands why he should be making that decision. It's really cool, it's a really interesting take on a strategic genius. After all, it's kind of boring if all of the Primarchs are just all really, really smart. It's far more interesting if one of them is a bit more... savage, perhaps, should I say. A bit more instinctual. He's still really good at what he does, but he is so in a different way. I quite appreciate that. And speaking of appreciation, it is shilling time once again. Prepare your buttholes for a random advertisement. Now, let us leave the lion to his brand new litter box for a little while and go back to Caliban, where things are about to get very interesting indeed. We already, of course, know that Caliban is a world that is a bit more steeped in the warp than what is strictly healthy. We also now learn that this problem has been increasing quite drastically, alongside the recent uptick in instabilities and outright revolt on the world of Caliban, to the point that even a trained psyker like Zahariel can be swept along with its eds and tithes. And considering how long this insurrection seems to have actually been going on, that might not be a coincidence. Zahariel got a little bit curious after hearing about this insurrection and the fact that it appeared to have come as a complete surprise to the Lord of Caliban. Something that would seem a little bit odd considering just how good Luther is at doing what he does. So Zahariel delved back in the records a little bit and started finding traces suggesting that this insurrection had, in some form or another, been going on possibly for years and years. This seemed, again, rather odd to Zahariel. How could Luther not have noticed this? If it was obvious to him, then surely Luther must have been aware, and yet it didn't appear that Luther had done anything to stop it. Granted, the insurrectionists had been rather smart and had been hiding their maneuvers, to a degree that almost seemed suspiciously like expertise, Nevertheless, if Zahariel could spot it, surely Luther should have been able to as well. And to further fuel Zahariel's suspicions, Luther comes to him to inform him 
that he has received word, through Lord Cypher, that the leaders of the rebels wish to have a parley, an ancient Caliban tradition in which both parties will get together on a predetermined set of conditions and not viciously beat one another to death with swords. Of course, that's all well and good back on Caliban when wars of extermination simply wasn't a thing, because of course if you wipe out a knightly order, it's going to be rather difficult for said now dead order to protect everyone from the great beasts in the forests. The Imperium, however, functions on an entirely different series of principles. As far as the Imperium is concerned, if you're not fighting to wipe your enemy out, then you're not fighting hard enough and you're probably going to lose. Somewhat unsurprisingly, the leadership of the Resistance was made up primarily of those who had once been in power. Previous knights, barons, nobles, etc. Those most clearly inconvenienced by the Imperium's arrival. They demanded that the Imperium's occupation of Caliban cease. They also tried to appeal to Luther's, um, shall we say, injured pride. Not the worst thing to target, to be entirely honest, as they try to appeal to his sense of ego again. Not a particularly bad target. By stating that the Lion has done everything that Luther should have done. The Lion would never have been able to ally the various knightly orders if it wasn't for Luther. Luther should be the one to unite Caliban. He should have been the one to wipe out the Great Beasts, so on and so on, and... To a certain extent, they're not wrong. If the lion never arrived on Caliban, in all due likelihood, Luther would have been the great man of the age. Could he have eradicated the great beasts? Possibly. If anything, I would think it more questionable whether or not he would have had the vision to even try, but, well, we will never know now, will we? Zahariel outright rejects the rebels' demands and their characterization of the Imperium's presence as an occupation. Luther, whilst also rejecting at the very least verbally the characterization, is clearly a little bit more shaken up. At the end of the parlay, he is told that the lion had lied to them. The forests were gone, but the great beasts remained. This is something we'll get a look at a little bit later on in the book, as it turns out that even though the forests have indeed gone away, there are still monsters. A somewhat cryptic statement at the moment, perhaps, but it will be rather obvious later on. But for now, the greatest problem facing the Master of Caliban was the rapidly increasing pace of the insurrectionists' attacks. They had moved away from acts of sabotage and started utilizing the weapons they had previously stolen from the various Imperial plants, and they were now using them to try and attack Imperial transports. These transports were carrying the various resources, arms, weapons, ammunition, etc., that Caliban was producing for the wider Imperium. It may very well be that the rebels were trying to cast doubt upon Caliban's allegiance and therefore force the rest of Caliban into a corner where they had to choose sides. On the other hand, it might also be a ridiculously stupid move, as if they managed to interrupt enough of the various supplies heading out of Caliban, then the Imperium would have to respond in a considerably more determined fashion. This may have united Caliban behind the rebels, or it might simply have wiped them all out. They were playing a very high-stakes game at the moment. But at least they had proven rather proficient at what they were doing. Despite increased Imperial security and active patrolling by various Jaeger regiments, they had been able to shoot down a few Imperial transports. Minor ones, granted, they had not been able to down a single one of the larger transports, only damage them on occasion. But nevertheless, this wasn't supposed to be happening at all. So even these relatively meager results were far more than Luther could frankly stomach. He was also coming under mounting pressure from various administratum personnel on the planet, which lay all of the blame for this insurrectionist campaign squarely at his feet and demanded to know what he was going to do about it. Preferably long before, Caliban had to default upon their commitments to the Imperium. It was during one of these somewhat heated meetings that they received a somewhat puzzling piece of news. 
one administratum station had sent out a distress call which had been verified as correct, and then it had simply been cut off after a mere 32 seconds, mid-sentence. It was not jammed, it was simply just... gone. Of course, Jaeger Command had contingencies in place for just such an event, the event being an assumed rebel attack, and reinforcements were immediately dispatched, an entire reinforced company with aerial support. It should have been more than enough to deal with any rebel attack, and yet, five minutes after the relief force had landed, Command had not received any word whatsoever about what had actually happened at the facility. No reports of combat, no reports of a false alarm, nothing. Very unusual indeed. So far, Luther had been hesitant to deploy his Astartes. He had a full scout chapter ready and considerably more if needed, but he had been, fairly understandably so, reluctant to deploy them against his own population. Now, however, it would appear that a suitable excuse had been created. At the very least, Zahariel thought so, as he forced Luther's hand, stating that previously the Astartes had not been deployed because there was not a pressing need. Clearly, that had now changed. Luther was not overly fond of this, but he did also understand that Zahariel did have a point in this. Anything that it could take out an entire reinforced company of Jaegers before they could even get off a distress call that's the kind of shit you'd probably want to be sending Astartes to deal with. When the Astartes arrived at the site, headed up by Zahariel, he quickly realised that something was very, very off about all of this. There were no signs of combat, no sign of assault, no sign of a struggle, nothing zero zip nilch null nada, and still no contact with the relief force. To make things considerably more spooky, he also tried reaching out to feel the warp energy surrounding the area, and somewhat unsurprisingly, they were kicking up one hell of a storm. Additionally, he recognised the area. The trees were gone and the landscape was most certainly changed, but this was around about the same place where he had fought the last Calibanite lion, and where he had had his little encounter with the Watchers in the Dark. This means then that this was a hotspot for all manners of horrible warp activity. Someone had sure picked one hell of a location to put down a factory. Oh, and of course, the Vox stops working the moment they enter the perimeter. Because of course it does. Horror movie tropes aside, it's time for Zaharil to try and figure out what exactly has happened here. Again, there seems to be no signs of combat, there doesn't seem to be anybody actively shooting at them, and yet an entire reinforced company went poof, with their transports still idling on the landing pad. The obvious conclusions would appear to be that the complex had been infiltrated in some fashion by the rebels, but even then, that doesn't explain how the complex could have been overrun so thoroughly, and the reinforcements along with it. And speaking of the reinforcements, there weren't any corpses around. Plenty of blood, but no bodies. And the entire plant seemed to be operating just like it was supposed to, except for one section, in which all of the cameras had been disabled. The cameras overlooking the thermal vent. So, the corpses have to be somewhere. The only place they can't see is deep beneath ground, close to a thermal vent, and now, to make sure, Zahariel is going to have to lead his Astartes down there to see what's up. This is sounding awfully familiar, isn't it? All they need now is a bunch of demonic entities popping out of the woodwork, and oh, guess what? Oh, well, not technically demons in this case, just gargantuan centipedes, about as thick as an Astartes arm and twice as long, capable of digging their way through ceramite with their claws. Yeah, that'll do, that'll do. There was one key difference, however, from Sarosh. On Sarosh, the demonic entity was clearly demonic, otherworldly, not from the planet, here, however, although these insects are clearly not normal, and the stink of the warp lies heavy upon them, they are unmistakably off Caliban. 
In fact, they look precisely like a creature native to Caliban, but grown to ridiculous proportions. Now, of course, we already know that there is something very, very wrong with the planet, but this is the first time that Zahariel gets a real indication just how bad it really is. And it's also very clear that he is in denial. He keeps saying that this is Caliban. This can't be happening here. This is his home. It is not tainted. It cannot be tainted. And yet, he is currently fighting a gigantic centipede with a dagger-like protrusion trying to whack its way through his helmet. And whilst he's busy dealing with pest control, let's have a quick look in on the lion and his situation. After winning the fight in orbit relatively convincingly, although not a complete annihilation, the rebel fleet had to withdraw. After that, the Astartes were quickly deployed to the surface of Diamat to aid the local defenders, both Adeptus Mechanicus and a formation of Dragoons. The traitors quickly decided to withdraw. Considering their fleet was bugging the fuck out and they were now facing an unknown number of Adeptus Astartes, you can hardly blame them. Thusly, Diamat was saved. Or, well, a stay of execution, anyways. After leading his men on the planet below, Lionel Johnson retreated back to his battle barge and invited the two local Imperial commanders to join him. The Imperial Governor of the planet, Colix, and the acting Chief Adept of the Mechanicus, Archoy. The commander of the local Imperial Army Regiment had been killed in the initial strike, and ever since the Dragoons had been under the command of the Governor. And speaking of said Governor, he was unsurprisingly a little bit... Cautious around the Thestartes who had so recently come riding to their rescue. Considering his planet had just been invaded by the War Master, you could probably again excuse the fact that he's a little bit nervous standing face to face with a goddamn Primarch. And especially one as sociable as Lionel Johnson, who <laughs> immediately, of course, informs the governor that they're not done yet, and in all your likelihood, Horus will be sending a second flotilla as soon as he gets word of this one's defeat. And this time, he'll be sending Sons of Horus along with it. <laughs> not one for pillow talk, Lionel Johnson, oh no. I mean, yes, I understand you've just survived an invasion from the War Master's forces, somebody you never thought you'd be facing, but he's going to be sending Astartes soon, and you're probably fucked. So, um, you know, pucker up, sweetheart. Again, he's not mistaken, the War Master probably will be sending his elites, but maybe he could have couched it in a slightly more sensitive format, shall we say. And after he's had a quick meeting with the two, something even more interesting happens. He turns to Nemuel and asks for his impressions on the two. Nemuel gets the impression that perhaps the lion couldn't read them at all. I don't think it's quite that bad. I think the lion is doubting himself more so than being unable to read them. I think he has a pretty good idea of what kind of people they are, because when Nemuel gives him his impression of the Imperial Governor, he seems relieved that it concurs with his own, as if he's thinking to himself, okay, I got that one right, good. I think it's not that he can't read people, I think it is that he himself is starting to doubt his ability to read people. After all, he was, as far as he is concerned, betrayed by his de facto father. Somebody that he trusted unequivocally. That undoubtedly put a little bit of a dent in his self-esteem. And as for the Chief Magus, well, he's a walking, talking toaster, so reading his emotions is kind of pointless to begin with. Though, it would appear as if Johnson has suspected him just a tiny little bit. He asks him to provide a full manifest detailing the various pieces of equipment stored on Diamet. The Magus is somewhat hesitant and circumspect, stating that it would be impossible to give a proper account of all of the materials stored since several of the outlying forges were overrun by the traitors. The Lion, of course, says that he understands and that he will expect the Magus to do his best, in particular in organizing a manifest over what remains in the primary forges. The Magus says that he'll get right on that. 
In the meantime, he offers to repair the various weapons and equipment of the Astartes, along with rearming and repairing their ships. The Astartes decide to make do with repairing their own gear, but they can't very well refuse the services of the Mechanicus when it comes to repairing their ships. He also accepted the aid of the Mechanicus' remaining troops on the planet, though they didn't mount to much, a bit over a thousand Skitari. In addition to that, there was the Governor's Dragoons and 180 odd Dark Angels. Not much of a force, but again, Horus was running out of time. With his first raiding force defeated, he would then rapidly have to dispatch a strike force of the Sons of Horus. In all due likelihood, considering the fact that he had to use most of them to fortify Istvan and other businesses, he wouldn't be able to dispatch too much. Or at least so the Lion hoped. Whether or not he would be correct in this gamble, well, you'll have to wait until the next episode to find that out. Until then, I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.